Good morning. Myself, Dr. K. Vijay Raghava, Professor, Department of Periodontics, Sri Rajiv Gandhi College of Dental Sciences. Today's topic of discussion is dental plaque, and we will be dealing it under the following headings. We will be talking about the introduction, definition, history, classification, composition, structure and uh, formation and colonization and plaque maturation, plaque as a biofilm and we will talk about plaque hypothesis and finally conclusion and references. Definitions. Davis et al. in 1963 defined plaque as a soft tenacious material found on the tooth surfaces which is not readily removed by rinsing with water. Bowen in 1976 defined dental plaque as a structured, resilient, yellow, grayish substances that adheres tenaciously to intraoral hard surfaces, including removable and fixed restorations. Materia alba. Materia alba refers to the soft accumulation of bacteria and tissue cells that lack the organized structure of dental plaque and are easily displaced with a water spray. Calculus is a hard deposit that forms by mineralization of dental plaque and is generally covered by a layer of unmineralized plaque. Coming to the history, in 1897, it was Leon Williams who described the dental plaque. In 1899, G. V. Black coined the term gelatinous dental plaque. In 1950, Verog described the importance of the bacterial plaque in the etiology of periodontal diseases. Lowe et al. did a landmark study on plaque in 1965 and said that plaque is the major etiological factor in the periodontal disease. Then in 1970s, it was Walter Lodge who gave the modern theories of plaque hypothesis, which we are going to talk about in our later slides. Then in 1990s, it was P. D. Marsh who told us about the ecological plaque hypothesis also. Now, coming to the classification, Glickman has classified plaque into supragingival plaque and subgingival plaque. Supragingival plaque is that plaque that is found at or above the gingival margin. When in direct contact with the gingival margin, it is referred to as the marginal plaque. Whereas subgingival plaque is that plaque that is found below the gingival margin, between the tooth and the gingival pocket epithelium. Now, the supragingival plaque can be divided further into coronal plaque, marginal plaque, or fissural plaque. Whereas the subgingival plaque is divided into tooth associated, unattached, or tissue associated subgingival plaque. Now coming to the supragingival plaque, it is uh, a stratified organization of a multi-layered accumulation of bacterial morphotypes. Predominantly it consists of uh, gram positive cocci and short rods. Whereas subgingival plaque it has a different composition when compared to that of the supragingival plaque because of uh, the local availability of blood products, because of low oxidation reduction potential and because of the anaerobic environment. There is predominance of gram negative rods and filaments as well as spirochetes in the subgingival plaque. The subgingival plaque is again subdivided into tooth associated or tissue associated subgingival plaque. 
the tooth associated subgingival flaw it is adherent to root cementum in the cervical region it mainly consists of more of filamentous microorganisms including gram positive rods and cocci but in the deeper parts of the pocket slowly the filamentous microorganisms reduce in number whereas in the apical portion they are almost absent okay and there is more of gram negative rods will predominate mainly in the apical region whereas in the tissue associated subgingival plaque there is a predominance of streptococcus intermedius p gingivalis provotella intermedia tandrella forsythia as well as fusobacterium nucleatum the host tissue cells may also be found sometimes bacteria are found within the host tissues so basically uh, there is a site specificity of plaque that is significantly associated with the diseases of the periodontium the marginal plaque is usually associated with initiation and development of marginal gingivitis whereas supra gingival plaque and tooth associated subgingival plaque is critical for calculus formation and root caries whereas the tissue associated subgingival plaque is important in tissue destruction and it characterizes different forms of periodontitis now coming to the composition the intercellular matrix of the plaque can be divided into two components basically it contains the organic constituents as well as the inorganic components the organic constituents mainly includes the polysaccharides proteins glycoproteins lipid material and dna whereas the inorganic components predominantly calcium and phosphorus is present with trace amounts of other minerals such as sodium potassium and fluoride coming to the structure of the dental plaque it is said that the plaque contains more than 500 distinct species of microorganisms and 1 gram of plaque may contain approximately 10 to the power of 11 bacteria the number of bacteria in supra gingival plaque on a single tooth surface can exceed up to 10 to the power of 9 cells whereas in a periodontal pocket the count can range from 10 to the power of 3 bacteria in a healthy crevice to more than 10 to the power of 8 bacteria in a deep pocket apart from uh, bacteria the plaque also contains certain non bacterial microorganisms like mycoplasma species yeast protozoa and viruses yeah now let us talk about the formation of uh, dental plaque which is a very very important step and this formation of dental plaque is divided into three stages the first one is the formation of pellicle on the tooth surface second is the initial adhesion and attachment of bacteria and the third stage is colonization and plaque maturation now coming to formation of the pellicle it is the initial phase of plaque development all surfaces in the oral cavity including the soft and hard tissues are coated with a layer of organic material known as acquired pellicle it is a thin saliva derived layer it mainly forms by selective adsorption of the environmental macromolecules through electrostatic van der waals or hydrophobic forces they mainly contain glycoproteins phosphoproteins histidine rich proteins and proline rich proteins as well as enzymes like amylase which will function as adhesion sites for the bacteria so it is said that for the bacteria to adhere the pellicle should have been on the surface few hours prior next is the second stage that is the initial adhesion and attachment of bacteria which is again divided into four steps as you can see 
first is the transport to the surface second is initial adhesion third attachment after the initial adhesion and the fourth step is colonization of the surface now coming to the phase 1 or first step in the second stage that is transport to the surface this involves the initial transport of the bacteria to the tooth surface it can occur through brownian motion or through sedimentation of the microorganisms or through liquid flow or through active bacterial movement through chemotactic activity this picture shows about the pellicle formation then there is uh, the transport of bacteria to the tooth surface followed by the reversible attachment or initial adhesion between the bacteria as well as the tooth surface this is called as initial adhesion and this is initiated when the bacterial cell comes into close proximity to the surface the long and short range forces including van der waals attractive forces and electrostatic repulsive forces operate at this distance the phase 3 is the strong attachment that is after the initial adhesion a firm anchorage between the bacteria and the surface is established and there is a strong cell to cell binding is established and this is determined by the presence of adhesion proteins or carbohydrates on the organism and the complementary receptor proteins on the tooth surface one such example of strong attachment or firm anchorage is given by actinomyces viscosus which possesses fimbri that contains adhesins that binds to the proline rich protein of the dental pellicle and the whole process is very very species specific the last and the final stage is colonization and plaque maturation it mainly occurs through two mechanisms one is coaggregation and coadhesion the primary colonizing bacteria that has adhered to the tooth surface provide new receptors for attachment to the other bacteria as a part of process known as coadhesion whereas coaggregation is a cell to cell recognition of genetically distinct cell types it occurs primarily through highly specific stereochemical interaction of protein and carbohydrate molecules located on the bacterial cell surfaces well characterized interaction between the microorganisms occurs through coaggregation initially coaggregation occurs between two gram positive microorganisms which are called as primary colonizers and at a later stage coaggregation then occurs between gram positive and gram negative microorganisms which are called as secondary colonizers and finally coaggregation between different gram negative species are seen one such special example of coaggregation is concorp formation or concorp structure which is a feature of plaque that is present on tooth associated with gingivitis it consists of a central gram negative filamentous core that supports the outer cockal cells which are firmly attached by the interbacterial adherence or coaggregation the dna hybridization methodology defined different color complexes of periodontal microorganisms the composition of the complex was based on the frequency with which the different clusters of microorganisms were recovered see initially the primary colonizers or the early colonizers predominantly the gram positive microorganisms 
are the first to come and adhere to the tooth surface and these were categorized as yellow complex or purple complex as you can see in the picture. The example are the streptococcus species as well as the actinomyces species respectively. Then the secondary colonizers or the late colonizers or predominantly the gram negative bacteria will come and adhere to the tooth surfaces at the later stages of co-aggregation and they were categorized as green complex, orange complex as well as red complex. The example of green complex is aggregator species. Some of the examples of orange complex is uh, Provetella intermedia, Fusobacterium nucleatum and some of the examples of uh, red complex is uh, the P. gingivalis, Tandrella forsythia and Treponoma denticola and this red complex is the last set of microorganisms which will come and adhere to the tooth surface and it is of particular interest because it is associated with the bleeding on probing which is an important clinical parameter of destructive periodontal diseases. So, the existence of complexes is a reflection of bacterial interdependency in the biofilm environment. Yeah, coming to the factors that affect supragingival dental plaque formation. The first point is the topography of the supragingival plaque. Early plaque formation of the teeth follows a typical growth pattern with initial growth along the gingival margins and from the interdental space and further extension towards the coronal direction. But certain surface irregularities such as pits, fissures, grooves, cracks etc. can offer a favorable plaque growth pattern. The second point is the surface micro roughness. See basically the rough intraoral surfaces example crown margins, implant abutments and denture bases accumulate and retain more plaque in calculus in terms of thickness, area and colony forming units. Coming to the individual variables that influence plaque formation, basically the rate of plaque formation differs significantly between subjects. So a distinction is often being made between heavy that is either fast and light or slow plaque formers. The next point is the variation within the dentition. It is said that the plaque formation is more in the lower jaw when compared to that of the upper jaw, more in the molar areas than any other site, more, uh, more on the buccal than on the palatal sites, especially in the upper jaw, more in the interdental region than on the buccal side. The next point is the impact of gingival inflammation. Plaque formation is relatively more and rapid on the tooth surfaces along the inflamed gingival margins than on those adjacent to the healthy gingival. The last point is the impact of patient's age. Studies have shown that patient's age does not influence plaque formation but the developed plaque in an older individual resulted in more severe gingival inflammation. Now coming to plaque hypothesis, in the mid 1900s, periodontal diseases were believed to result from an increased accumulation of plaque along with the diminished host response and increased host susceptibility. So this thinking gave rise to a new concept called as non-specific plaque hypothesis which was given by Walter Loesch in the year 1976. According to the non-specific plaque hypothesis, periodontal disease results from the elaboration of noxious products by the entire plaque flora. What it means to say is small amounts of plaque will produce small amounts of noxious products which can be neutralized by the host. Similarly, large amounts of plaque will produce large amounts of noxious products which will overwhelm the host defense 
and the disease state will set in. So the control of periodontal disease depends on the control of the amount of plaque accumulation. Okay, so the standard current treatment of uh, periodontitis by debridement and by proper oral hygiene measures focuses on the removal of plaque and its products. Although the non-specific plaque hypothesis has been discarded in favor of specific plaque hypothesis, but much clinical treatment is still based on the non-specific theory itself. So, what are the drawbacks of non-specific plaque hypothesis? The first and foremost is, you know, some individuals with the considerable amount of plaque and calculus and gingivitis never developed destructive periodontitis. You know, so the non-specific plaque hypothesis was not able to answer this question. The second one is, you know, few other sites which demonstrated periodontitis. They further demonstrated site specificity in the pattern of disease. Like, you know, few sites were unaffected, whereas advanced disease was found in the adjacent sites. So, in the presence of uniform host response, these findings were inconsistent. And further, the, the concept that, you know, all plaque are equally pathogenic was under dispute. So, so this gave rise to a new hypothesis called as specific plaque hypothesis, which was again given by Walter Lodge in the year 1976. The specific plaque hypothesis states that only certain plaque is pathogenic and its pathogenicity depends on the presence of or increase in the number of specific microorganisms. This concept predicts that, you know, the plaque that harbors the specific bacterial pathogens only resulted in periodontal disease because these organisms were capable of producing substances that would mediate the destruction of the host tissues. So, one such classic example of specific plaque hypothesis is the association between aggregatobacter actinomycetum comitans with localized aggressive periodontitis. Yeah. Now, coming to the association of plaque microorganisms with periodontal diseases, three factors determine whether periodontitis will occur in a subject. The first and foremost is a susceptible host. Second is the presence of pathogenic species. Third is the absence or presence of small proportion of beneficial bacteria. Yeah. The first and foremost is the susceptible host. Uh, <clears throat> the susceptibility of the host is influenced by systemic, environmental and behavioral factors. Smoking is considered as a very important risk factor for periodontitis. It increases periodontal destruction and delays healing after periodontal therapy. Stress, especially in combination with inadequate coping behavior, seems to aggravate the periodontal destruction. <clears throat> Next is the diabetes. There is a strong two-way relationship between diabetes and periodontitis. And periodontitis has been included uh, as a sixth complication of diabetes by Lowe et al. in the year 1993. And uh, lastly, role of genetic variations. So all these factors makes the host more susceptible to disease process. Next is the presence of pathogens. Certain microorganisms like uh, P. gingivalis, Tandrella forsythia, or AA committants demonstrate strong evidence as it as an etiological factor in periodontitis. Certain other microorganisms like uh, Provotella intermedia, Fusobacterium nucleatum, spirochetes demonstrate moderate evidence as an etiological factor for periodontal disease. But whatever it may be, these pathogens should be present in sufficient number to bring about the disease process. The third is the beneficial species. See, these beneficial species may prevent the disease progression in several ways. First and foremost, they can occupy the space which may be otherwise colonized by the pathogens. 
So thus limiting the ability of the pathogen to adhere to the tissue surface and further they might adversely affect the growth of the pathogen and they can affect the ability of the pathogen to produce virulence factors and further they might degrade the virulence factors produced by the pathogens. So one such example is association between the streptococcus sanguis and actinomycetum combatants. See the streptococcus sanguis uh, produces hydrogen peroxide which either directly or by host enzyme amplification can kill the AA combatants. Criteria for identification of periodontal pathogens. Robert Koch in the year 1870 developed the criteria by which an organism can be judged as a causative agent in human infection and he called it as cause postulates. According to this, the microorganism should be routinely isolated from the deceased individual. It should be grown in pure culture in the laboratory. Should produce similar disease when inoculated into experimental or susceptible laboratory animals and must be recovered from lesions in a deceased laboratory animal. So if a particular microorganism satisfies all these postulates, then it can be termed as a causative agent in that particular human infection. But there was difficulties in applying cause postulates in periodontitis. The first and foremost is inability to culture all the organisms that is associated with periodontitis, especially the oral spirochetes. Two, difficulties in defining and culturing active disease sites. Three is lack of good animal model system for the study of periodontitis. So it was Sigmund Sokransky in the year 1998, you know, gave a new criteria called as Sokransky's criteria and he said that a potential pathogen must be associated with the disease and it should be present in large numbers at the disease sites. Two, it should be eliminated or it should be decreased in sites that demonstrate clinical resolution following the treatment. It should demonstrate a host response, either cellular or humoral immune response. It should be capable of uh, producing disease in experimental animal models. And finally, it should demonstrate virulence factors for enabling the microorganism to cause destruction of the periodontal tissues. Finally, we'll conclude with a small note on biofilm. Biofilm it is defined as single cells and or micro colonies enclosed in a highly hydrated, predominantly anionic exopolymer matrix. This definition was given by Costerton in the year 1995. The resistance of the bacteria to antimicrobial agents is dramatically increased within the biofilm. It is said that they are about 1000 times more resistant to, to, to antibiotics than in their planktonic state. So this resistance to antibiotics is mainly brought about by, by certain special bacterial behavior in the biofilms. And this is affected by their nutritional status, growth rate, temperature, pH and prior exposure to sub-effective concentration of antimicrobial agents. The, 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 the bacteria within the biofilm, you know, it grows in a much slower rate, so thus making them less susceptible to most of the antibiotics. The bacteria within the biofilm can resist diffusion through ion exchange mechanism. There are certain extracellular enzymes like formaldehyde lyase, formaldehyde dehydrogenase or beta lactamase which can inactivate the antibiotics. There is presence of super resistant bacteria within the biofilm which has multi-drug resistant pumps that can extrude the antimicrobial agent from the cell. And in the biofilm, the bacteria have a special capacity to communicate with each other. And this special property of biofilm is called as quorum sensing. And this quorum sensing plays a very important role in the expressing genes for antibiotic resistance 
and it will help in encouraging the growth of beneficial species to the biofilm and it will discourage the growth of competitors. So to conclude, dental plug is uh, considered as the primary etiological factor for periodontal diseases and uh, dental plug acts as a biofilm possessing special pathogenic characteristics are much more harmful than in their planktonic state. So any self-performed and professionally administered treatment protocol to contain the plaque in calculus still remains the mainstay in prevention of oral biofilm associated diseases. So these are uh, certain questions that is uh, invariably asked in the university examination. Long essay, you know, define plaque and enumerate stages of plaque formation can be asked. In the short essay, plaque hypothesis or uh, properties of biofilm can also be asked. And uh, in short answers, we can expect uh, cost postulates, Sokransky's criteria and classification of dental plaque can also be asked. Thank you.